morning, church family. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you this morning to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City. If you are ready to rise together and worship with me this morning, we'll go ahead and get started with our worship. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and lead us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for your our joy and prize, to see the captives' hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor, and peace, we lay down our Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the I just want to welcome everybody. Say, so, uh, man, so glad to see everybody that, that is here. And um, I uh, have just a, a few things that I want to let you know that's kind of going on in the church family. Then we're going to pray and just continue to uh, focus uh, all of our attention on Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and worship him today. Um, but one of the things I wanted to uh, just let you know, there, there right now is a flu clinic out in our parking lot that's going on, um, and it's a drive-through clinic, and we've done this before, but it's also walk-up, and, uh, you know, as we were singing about, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're your kingdom here and we're your church. I'm thinking, man, where did the church go? And I think some of them are out there getting their flu shot, I hope, and going to be right back in. So um, but I'm glad you're, you're here. And, um, and we want to thank those who are joining us uh, uh, also by Facebook Live today. Uh, glad that you're here. And uh, we're just going to have a, a, great, a great time worshiping and opening our hearts up to God. Uh, today. Um, another thing I wanted you to be aware of is that on October 30th, 
uh, we have a, uh, a deacon work day. And basically that's for uh, widows, widowers, and senior adults. Um, and the deacons want to know, man, if you have some needs or if you have a special need, uh, let our deacons know. Um, you can call the church office so that maybe they can help you out with that need on October 30th. And one other thing that I wanted to uh, let the church family know is that um, we do have, uh, we have our core um, uh, team uh, ministering to our little ones in the nursery. Uh, but right now we do have a need for a few more helpers in the nursery area. And so if just me saying something like that puts that on your heart, uh, please uh, either let the church office or let the, the, the nursery personnel know um, that you would be willing to go love on those kids. If you don't like kids, maybe seek out a different ministry, right? Um, but if you do like kids, we might, you know, we could definitely use you. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that yesterday we had the, the privilege of opening up our church parking lot in a very special way. Um, our uh, North Kansas City Police Department um, was looking for a, um, a space where they could have positive interactions with the community, but do it with support of, of local churches and the faith community. And so they asked if they could use our parking lot for an event where they'd bring some police cars and some officers and, and try to meet and greet the community in positive ways. And so we did that. But we also had some volunteers from our church that uh, cooked hot dogs and hamburgers for everybody. And it was just a great time. And we probably had about 40, 50 from the church and about uh, maybe 40, 50 from the community and just had a great time. Um, and I, I think it was a great connection with our community and an uplift to our local police department who serves us uh, faithfully. And so I wanted you to be aware of that. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll just focus everything uh, laser-focused on Jesus Christ today. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for the privilege to gather today. And Father, um, we just want to open up our lives to you. We realize that the greatest worship that we bring is when we bring ourselves to you. God, you've told us in your word to present ourselves and our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to you, which is our spiritual worship. And so I just pray that as we, as we sing these songs together, that they would be sung to you. And God, that we would focus on sharing the, the same message with each other through that. And then as we as we open up your word in just a little while, I pray that we could really hear your word for us individually and as a church. And we thank you now that you have loved us so much that even though we've been estranged from you in our own waywardness, that you would reach out to us and, and, and that you would breach that chasm that we can't breach and come to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his death his burial, and his resurrection, that we might know that there's new resurrected spiritual life in you that is eternal. And we celebrate that as, uh, as a family of faith today. Thank you that we can be here. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God. the 
We're going to enter in a time of a prayer in a moment, but before we do so, I want us just to ponder and reflect and consider. We're in the presence of God, and we're also in the presence of one another. So when we pray today to be mindful of our relationship with God, our journey and walk with Him, but also our journey and walk with one another. So see the people that we are with today. I mean, really see them. Valued and loved and created by God. People with great stories to tell people who have lots of burdens as well. And be mindful, those that aren't in here, maybe they are still getting their flu vaccine, maybe maybe they're serving right now. You know, teaching, working with children in the nursery, working with children in Illuminate. Maybe they can't be here, but they really want to be here. And certainly we're mindful of those that are viewing by live stream. And so see them in your mind and remember them as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, our good and gracious God, and we have sung this morning praises to you of how great you are and more love and more power. How great thou art. And you are greater than all of our storms. You are greater than all of our problems. You're greater, you're greater, you're greater. You're greater than our burdens. You're greater than our fears. You're greater than our anxieties, our doubts and uncertainties. How great thou art. You are God. You are the incommunicable, the incomprehensible God, Yahweh. You are the God who is here. You are the God that is loving and knowing. And you are the God who is love and is power. And when we call to you for more love, more power, that is us saying more of you in us, more of you in our lives, more of you to replace those fears, uncertainties, doubts, to replace those sins and troubles, to replace those things that take us distant to you. We pray for more love, more power. That's more of you, O oh God, in our lives, closeness and oneness with you, Abba God, Father God giving God, merciful God, forgiving God, more of you, that we would be that to one another, that Christ in us to each other, that we would see one another and have love and respect for one another, that we would want to journey with each other and live this life of faith together and strengthen one another and give encouragement and exhortation and raise up and lift up one another in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, our savior, the king of kings. Oh God, that we might be your love and your power to each other in this community of faith so that as a community of faith, we can be your love and power to this world. So as we continue our worship, as we continue our praise, as we continue our time together today, may we be minded, reminded of your love and your power in us. And the power of Jesus Christ is shed blood and broken body, that we are covered in the righteousness of his sacrifice, that we have a new identity, that you see us as Christ, you see us as the redeemed ones, you see us in perfection that you create for us, that you make possible through Jesus. 
We thank you for the Holy Spirit being here, being our comforter, being our guide, being our advocate, and equipping us. So it is in the love of the Father and the sacrifice of the Son and in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit that this prayer, our prayer, is prayed. Amen and amen. Will you rise with me to finish this? And I will seek your face with all of my heart. And I will seek your face with all of my Please, uh, I hope you have a Bible, and if you do, please, uh, or have, if someone right around you has one, please turn to Galatians chapter 5. We've been working our way through Galatians. We're going to finish chapter 5 and get into the first part of <clears throat> chapter 6 today. And um, so uh, we're to the last chapter of Galatians after several months here. So um, Galatians chapter 5 uh, is where we'll start today. Um, we, you know, we all have those things that are favorite things for us to do. And one of the things that Gene and I, have, my wife and I have gotten to that we really enjoy doing is like just going on walks together and around the neighborhood. And yet it seems like we, we get into this uh, mode as we're walking around the neighborhood that we just kind of naturally get to where we start evaluating things. I don't know if you've ever done that. And so it's like we're going past a house and it's like, oh, wow, man, look at, the, look, at the, look at the shutters on that house or look at the door and it's like really awesome. And if we go by a house with like extra garages and stuff, I'm like, man, that would be like the house of my dreams. And um, we go by another house that's got really good curb appeal or whatever, Gina would be like, oh, that's the house of my dreams. And, uh, and then you go past some of the other houses, right? And it's like, oh, my goodness, what happened to that house, you know? And I always tell Gene, I said, I think the gutters are flying off of this thing and this is all a mess because I think that's probably a carpenter that lives there and he's so busy building everybody else's house he doesn't have time for his own, right? But, but how does a house get that way when it's all kind of messed up? And I think the answer would be neglect. It's like there's just not time uh, to deal with it. And um, I think that same idea... Um, applies to our spiritual life. And that's what the last part of Galatians chapter five is about. It's about how we can either grow in our spiritual life through our connection with God, or as we, as we go along in our life in Christ, as we get disconnected and there's neglect in our spiritual life, that can leave us in shambles. And so last week, we looked at some verses at toward the end of Galatians chapter 5, and it showed us a picture, a, a little bit of what spiritual neglect looks like. And we find that in verse 19, 
uh, of chapter 5 where it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Um, this is kind of like, this is what spiritual neglect looks like when your life isn't, you know, connected with God. He says, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. And then he starts mentioning all these social problems that come when spiritual realities are neglected. And he says, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. And then he says, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And, and so it's like a picture of, of, of what spiritual neglect could be. And then you go down a couple of verses later, and he starts showing us what, what it looks like when there is that good connection uh, with God in our life. And so, so here's, here's what, 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 what it looks like when we're, we're, we're being worked in our life uh, by God, and it says the fruit of the Spirit of God, the fruit of God's Spirit being at work in our life is love. This is in verse twenty-two, uh, chapter five, verse twenty-two. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And and so he says, uh, you know, and, and and the idea is that that's the fruit of God. That that comes as God is at work in our lives and our hearts. And basically what that is, is, is the spirit of God begins to create the character of Jesus Christ in our lives as we're connected to God in our spirit with the God who is spirit. And as that connection happens, uh, the fruit of the spirit comes. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's a lot like a tree, uh, you know, uh, and, and like, like we, or, or like any kind of fruit, we can cultivate the soil, but we can't make the fruit grow, okay? And so same thing, we can cultivate a spiritual life, but we can't make that kind of fruit grow. It has to be something that God does in us, just like God's got to be at work in the plant for it to produce fruit. And so when we neglect our spiritual lives and get connect connected, <clears throat> When we neglect our spiritual lives and get disconnected from God relationally, I mean, we still might do some things like go to church and we might even read our Bible and we, we might do some things, but, but that, that character of Jesus Christ is not being formed in us by his spirit. And yet when we do cultivate our spiritual lives, and get connected with God on a daily basis, and we're connected with him, and he's connected with us, then that character of Jesus begins to be formed in us. Now, today what I want to do, that was kind of like a recap of last week real quick. Today what I want to do is I want us to take the next step, and, and here's the key thought. When the fruit of the Spirit is produced in our lives, when the character of Jesus is being created in our lives through a work of God in our lives, it's not just for us. It's not just for you alone. It's kind of like when a tree produces fruit. That fruit is not just for the tree alone. That fruit is for somebody to walk by and pick that fruit and enjoy it, right? And same thing, when the Spirit of God produces the fruit of the Spirit in you and you start living the character of Jesus Christ, that's not just for you. It's for those who are around you. It's for your family. It's for your friends. It's for your church family. It's for your community and world. It's for them to, you know, benefit from and so with that being said, let, let's, uh, let's read uh, from uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, through Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. And, and here's our scriptures we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Galatians 5, 25 is where we'll start. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But <clears throat> let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his neighbor. And we're going to unpack that one later. Um, for each will have to bear his own load. 
Now, as I read over that several times and, and kind of tried to grasp what it was saying here and start kind of outlining just a little bit, I thought, you know what he's talking about here? He's talking about the church of my dreams. This is what I think a church ought to be as we relate together. Um, you know, a ch- it's kind of like when I was walking past those houses and I'd see, one, man, that'd be like the house of my dream. This is like the church of my dreams. Okay, it would be a church uh, where we're so filled with Christ's love and spirit that we have a common desire to forsake pride and resentment towards one another in a provoking spirit towards others. It would be a church that is so filled with, um, with, with, with God's heart for people that, that when we see someone going wayward from God, we would want to go after them and try to, try to bring them back in, you know, uh, uh, humbly and graciously and gently out of love. It would be a church that is so filled with mutual care and concern for one another, when we see somebody weighted down with the weights of this world, we would want to go to them and we would want to say, how can I help bear this burden? It would be a church where the people were so in tune with God's call in their own life that everyone would be wanting to, to just surrender to whatever the call is and do our part, where everyone is doing their part. It's not 20% of the people doing 80% of, of the work, um, basically. And so where does that kind of character and commitment it may come from, and the answer is through the Holy Spirit of God being at work in the people of God. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from us and our knowledge and our abilities. It comes from a work of God in our lives and in our hearts. And, 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 and then the other side of this would be, however, when a church gets filled with a condescending spirit towards each other and resentful attitudes towards each other, and, and we ne- neglect, as a, as a church family, uh, trying to restore those who are spiritually wayward, and we would ignore those who have burdens pressing down on them, and where it really is 80 per, I mean, 20% of the people doing all of the work, and, and not everybody's doing their part, and people are not seeking God's call in their life, we can know that at that point someone is neglecting the essential and the essential is that we are walking in the spirit where we are living in association with the spirit of God in our life. Now, um, according to Galatians chapter 5 verse 25, the essential thing is a work of God's spirit, walking in the spirit. Galatians 5, 25, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit and the idea is there we don't live spiritually apart from a work of the spirit of god it is the it is the spirit of god who comes to us in our in our uh, estrangement from God, in our waywardness and going our own way, and this chasm that can't be fixed, and we might get all religious, but we still can't get to God. And, 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 and it is God through, through his son and then through his spirit coming to us to grab onto us. And there's something in our, did y'all remember when there was something in your heart that was saying that, that Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, I just believe, I, I, I believe it's true. I've studied it out. I've done my research. And I, and I truly believe it. And I know there's something inside me that is compelling me to the truth of Jesus Christ. Man, that's the Holy Spirit at work in us. And then as we, as we receive Christ into our life, we're cleansed of our sins. And, 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 and his Holy Spirit is in us to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. All that is a work of the Spirit of God. When we go from spiritual death to spiritual life through, through embracing faith in Jesus Christ, that is a work of the Spirit of God. We are regenerated spiritually. Spiritual death to spiritual life. He says, if we live by the Spirit, if that's how we come to faith in Christ, walk by the Spirit. You you can't come to faith in Christ without a work of God's Spirit, and you can't live the life that God has for us in Christ without a continual work of God's Spirit. So keep walking in association with the Spirit of God. So, not, I guess might put you on the spot just a little bit. And some of y'all might even want to do this. But what if you were going to say to the person next to you, you're going to say, um, and now let me remember because I just lost my mind. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. What's the greatest thing that you have to offer the church? You know? I wonder, well, how would you answer that? 
You know, I, I mean, would it, would it be our presence? I mean, there's people who are glad to see you. I guarantee you there are. But is that the greatest thing we have to offer the church? And what if it's our resources? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, that helps the ministries keep going. But is that the greatest thing you have to offer the church? And what if it's your service, your time and service? And that certainly helps the ministries. And what, what you know, oh, what, what if it's, it's something else, you know? <laughs> what, what is the greatest thing? And, you know, maybe our leadership, that would help get things organized. But the greatest thing that you and I have to offer our church is a life that is lived in connection with the Spirit of God, that the character of Jesus Christ would be formed in us and that we would be his, you know, fully. Um, and uh, other things might help. Um, but if we're going to have a church where... You know, we, we have a mutual desire to forsake pride and, 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 and resentment towards each other. And we have a, 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 a mutual commitment to go after the wayward and to help those who are burdened and to do our part. That's going to take a work of the Spirit of God in us. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about what I think from these verses are the, the major characteristics of a church who's walking in the Spirit, okay? And, and here's the characteristics of that church, um, the churches it could be. Uh, number one, a common value for Christ-like relationships. Uh, chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 26 states the vision negatively. It says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When, when we value walking in the Spirit, that value is going to produce in us a desire to have the character of Jesus in us and that we're going to be relating to one another according to the character of Jesus in us and not just our own agendas in our own ways. And, and, and so that would uh, bring us to agree with verse 26, let us not become conceited. That's the first thing he says. Jesus wasn't conceited. I mean, if there was ever anyone who could be prideful and conceited, it would have been Jesus because, because he's perfect and he's perfect holiness. And, and, you know, uh, and, and yet he was never conceited. He, did, he didn't stand up here and say, hey, look at me. No, he stooped down to say, how can I serve you? You know, that's our Savior. And, and, and so conceited literally means to be desirous of vain glory. And it's vain glory because if we're desirous of it, we're trying to get others to say how great we are so we can feel better about ourselves. But even when they say how great we are, it's like it really doesn't, it really doesn't get us there because it's vain glory, you know. But we, we want that kind of thing sometimes. And, and so, so we shouldn't be conceited, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I have a better idea. I have a better job. I have a better ability. Uh, you know, let us not become conceited. Or provoking one another. And that would be being competitive and hostile towards others, perhaps, who don't agree with us. More concerned about what I want than what they need. Let's not become hostile towards one another provoking one another or envying one another, wanting what somebody else has because you're dissatisfied with your own place in things. And so we can't rejoice in what they have because we want what they have because we don't, we don't have that satisfaction in our own heart. And it, it's sad, it is sad when a church gets wound up in unchristlike attitudes and, and, and character in the way that we relate to one another. But man, when, when we all value Christ-like character, you see, I mean, that makes a difference. Um, I remember early in my, earlier in my pastoral ministry, I was at a uh, small town church, and there was, there was two factions in this church, and it was like, it was a difficult time is it for, for any kind of pastor. And uh, so I'm going to call the one faction in the church kind of the self-righteous faction, and they had their class, and they met, and they had a lot of Bible knowledge and stuff like that, and yet it seemed like in that Bible knowledge, they kind of looked down on some other people, and so I'm going to have the other the other kind of faction of the church, and we're, we're, we'll just call those kind of the, <clears throat> the resentful faction, um, uh, because they felt like this other group looked down on them. They decided that, um, uh, that they um, were going to, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> can, can somebody, uh, um, Sherry, could you get my water for me? Um, thank you. 
Thank you for being a servant. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so we had these two um, two groups were, you know, they, oh, and they, they were the resentful faction. And they were sitting around saying, but we're the, we're the people who are really genuine and really loving. And so, so this was kind of going on. I went to, to, I went to one of the deacons in the church, and, and, I, and I, said to, I said to him, man, I don't know what to do about this thing. And he said, well, I think the best thing you could do is just keep these two groups apart from each other. I thought, I thought keep them apart from, that is not the church of my dreams, to just keep them apart from each other so that these wrong attitudes can fester, you know? And then it all came to a head. The, the leader of the self-righteous group, uh, he was a, uh, a Sunday school teacher in the church. And the leader of the resent, resentful group, he was the Sunday school director in the church. Well, one of the people from the class came to the Sunday school director and said, I don't like the style that this person teaches. So he decided, since he was on the nominating committee, he was going to replace the teacher. So he replaces the teacher, but he doesn't tell the teacher that he's been replaced okay and and now and now now the teacher finds out that he's been replaced by somebody else and and so I got this powder keg that's about ready to blow up in the church and so on a Tuesday afternoon I was just sitting in the sanctuary of this little country church and I'm praying God I don't know what to do and 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 in walked the the, the, the Sunday school director guy. I mean, on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. And he comes and he sits down by me in the sanctuary. And we start praying together. And after we prayed for a little while, I looked at him and I said, you know what we need to do. And he goes, yeah, I know. And so we both went out, got in the car, drove to the Sunday school teacher's house. And, and there, <laughs> uh, you know, with that Sunday school teacher, I watched those men confess wrong attitudes and, and confess condescending and resentful spirits towards one another. They started praying together. They were hugging each other. And I said, yes, that is the church of my dreams. That's it. When there's a common value for Christ-like relationships. And, and so number two is a heart for spiritual restoration of the wayward in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, next verse, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, caught means to be overtaken. Sometimes we, in our Christian walk, we get overtaken by a transgression. And a transgression is to, to get off of God's path for us. It is to slip. It basically, as we go along, sometimes we slip into sin. Sometimes we step into sin. Sometimes we get off the path for God for us. And what he says is, you who are spiritual, not you who are perfect, because nobody is. He says, you who are spiritual, you who are, are seeking to walk in the spirit, restore, put back in right order those who have slipped off the path. But do it in a spirit of gentleness, he says. You know, um, uh, and, and that spirit of gentleness would mean a, 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 a humble spirit, having a proper estimation of yourself. And then he says, keep watch on yourself. Realize you too can slip off the path and make sure you haven't slipped off the path and don't even know it. You know, I, I get the idea of like the old <clears throat> Indiana Jones movies. If you've ever seen any of those and like Indiana Jones, you know, he's got this beautiful girl and they get themselves in a mess and they're running away and it's like they're on a suspension bridge and, and, and for some reason she slips and she's barely holding on by a rope and, and, and so you got Indiana Jones and so he comes back to get her and, and he, he reaches his hand down to grab her but before he reaches his hand and grabs onto her, he makes sure that he's got a good grip on the rope up here. Then he reaches down to grab her and he says, you know, uh, watch out for yourself, you Make sure you got a good grasp on God and, and on, the, uh, on, on the spirit of God and, and, and that he's got a hold of you. And then you, you help rescue those who are slipping off the path. You know, and let me just say, I don't think we're very good at this as churches. Uh, you know, it's hard. Um, it, if, if you're walking with God, 
um, and seeking to relate to others the way that Jesus would. You know, if you see someone who claims to know Jesus as Savior and Lord and they're slipping off the path, he's saying, don't just ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't pray for him. You know, um, and then he says, uh, he says to restore them. And I thought it was really interesting. It's a command of the church that we're to be, have a restoration ministry. You know, we, we can't say, well, I'm just not going to care about them. We can't do that and be faithful to God. Um, if we're walking in the spirit, we need to be part of the restoration ministry. And I want to confess, I, I do not find this to be easy. And, and, and here's another thing. As I get older, it doesn't become easier as you go. It seems to me that oftentimes wandering sheep don't want to be found. Um, you know, and sometimes you reach out to somebody and it doesn't go well. Sometimes it does go well. Uh, but it's tough. And, 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 and well, what if I reach out to somebody and then I get accused of judging them? I think we think that, don't we? You know? And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't tell us to judge him. He says, go to help restore him. You know, get him back on the path. But don't just sit around and ignore him. He, he, I mean, we know that's not right. Um, and certainly don't go around talking to them about, about, about them to somebody else. I mean, we know that's not right. You know, judging is when we form an opinion, but we decide not to go. Well, I'm just going to judge them then, you know. Uh, you know, perhaps we could be saying, well, I don't think they're worth it. For, you know. Or maybe we've already judged them. They're not going to have anything to do with it anyway. And so um, he says, you who are spiritual. Uh, by the way, he doesn't say the pastors are supposed to go and restore them. He doesn't say the church leaders are supposed to go. He said, we are. You know, the family of faith. Um, and we're to restore gently. Uh, which is the word for meek, which doesn't mean weak. It means power, but it's God's power under control. And that we would do it with a gentle spirit, a loving and a compassionate spirit, and keeping watch on ourselves because we slip too, you know? Certainly not arrogantly. By the way, gently does not mean painless either because the word restore means to like, uh, you know, had, had a sore arm, uh, to, to set a broken arm. That's what it means, um, and, uh, I, I remember a, it's been a few years ago, not a long time ago, but a few years ago, I had a staff member come to me and tell me, Hey, you know, it, it, and it was, it was like a year earlier, you know, when you, we had this experience and you said this and, and, and the staff member said, man, when you said that, that really hurt me. That wounded me. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking back, you know what my first response to her was? <laughs> I didn't say that. That's the first thing that came out of my mind. I didn't say that because the way I remembered it was a little different than the way she remembered it. And then as I looked in her eyes, I didn't see anger and I didn't see resentment. You know what I saw? I saw hurt. Man, and it broke me. And it was painful. And I had to repent because whatever it is that I said that day in that instant, it definitely wounded someone. And I thank God that somebody came to me so that that could be restored. Um, if you've ever dislocated a shoulder, you know they got to yank on it to get it set right, and it hurts. Um, I think self-righteous people, uh, they don't reach out to people. They just, sometimes they just sit on the sidelines and condemn, or, or they judge or put somebody down, or they gossip, and so... I thought this might be a good Sunday for me to remind you a little bit about gossip because, you know, it does happen and it, and it happens in churches. And I told the first service, if you stick around this church long enough, you're sometime, I'm pretty sure, going to hear somebody gossip because we can all fall in many ways. And that's one of the ways. And I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying it does happen. And, and by the way, what's gossip? Well, gossip when you're, is when you're talking negatively about somebody else, but it's, you know, you're not part of the problem and you're not, certainly not part of the solution. You know? But you're talking about it and, and talking negatively. 
you know. And, and so, so what's, the, what's the response to gossip? I thought it might be a good time to go over that. And the response to gossip, when somebody's talking negatively about someone, but they're, they're not part of the solution in that, in that situation, they're just sharing information negatively about someone, talking down about somebody, you know, is the best thing to do. Go, hey, that's gossip. Don't tell me that. You know, I don't think that's the best way to handle it. But let me give you two questions to ask. And I think these would be good ones to memorize because I think they can help each other along the way. And I think the first question to ask, and when somebody's talking negatively about somebody in a way that, you know, is kind of degrading them, but they're not part of the solution, and say, is anybody helping him? <laughs> is anybody helping her? You know, you just told me this. Is anybody helping him? I think that's a good question. The other one, I think, is even more, more has more horsepower behind it a little bit. But, you know, if somebody's talking to you negatively about somebody else, but it's, there's no solution in it. How does you telling me going to help this situation? I, that, that would put somebody maybe on the defensive. But how is you telling me this information going to help this situation? Because we're supposed to be restorers, not gossipers. And um, so, by the way, I, I never will forget, um, in high school, I had my most confusing and uh, rebellious times uh, as a Christian. And I remember I had a, a, a youth minister that he's okay if I came to church and he would receive me and wouldn't shun me or anything like that. But, you know, for me, it was a high school Sunday school teacher that came to me to, to rescue me, you know, to grab on to me while I'm slipping further and further away, and I thank God for him. So the church of my dreams, when we value Christ-like relationships, when we have a heart for spiritual restoration for the wayward, and here's number three, a minister of burden sharing among the membership. In, in, in verse two and three, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And to, to bear a burden means to pick it up. And when somebody is weighted down with a heavy weight in life, we're to come and we're to, we're to help carry that burden with them. And the implication here is we all have burdens and they might be burdens of our own making. And you know, we might have a burden because we're struggling with an addiction or, or we're struggling you know, with something we did or something we said. It, it might be a struggle with a financial problem, you know, just something that came to us. It, it might be a struggle with a past hurt you know, that we just can't seem to get over, a, a, a struggle with someone who has betrayed us and now we're alone. And there's many reasons why we get burdened down in life. But he says, as we get burdened down in life, we're to go to one another and we're to try to seek to help lift up one another in the midst of our burdens is what he's saying here. And I'm telling you, this is the church of my dreams. <laughs> And, and I just wrote some things down. Here's, here's the church of my dreams. Um, and and by, uh, it, when the suffering are comforted, when the grieving are consoled, when the elderly are honored, and when the weak are strengthened, when the needy are helped, when the lonely are befriended, when the weary are upheld. You know, it says, it says when, we, when we help bear each other's burdens, it fulfills the law of Christ. Well, what's the law of Christ. Well, you go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, and that verse tells us that the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's one of the characteristics of a church that's walking in the Spirit, that we're bearing each other's burdens. And, and, and through the years as a pastor, I've gotten letters, and I've gotten the same letter over several times. I mean, not the same words, but the same ideas. And basically, the idea of, of the letter is this. Pastor Jim, when the church reached out to me in this struggle, I was so down, it restored my faith in God. And I've had that letter several times written to me as people reached out. I love it when I go to the hospital and, 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 and the person in the hospital, you know, I'm going there to try to minister. Oh, oh, there's already been three or four from, from, from my small group here. Uh, you can pray for me, but I'm good, Pastor. You know, it's like, yes, that's exactly the kind of church I want to be part of, you know. Um, you know, I, I love it when, 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 when you know, you, you go to somebody, they, they've had this financial need. Now, you know, uh, you know what, Pastor? My small group, they came together. You know what they did? Man, this is humbling, but it sure helped. They took up an offering just for me, and they got me through this, you know? And by the way, on a funny note, at the, at the church where I came from, there was, this, there was this mom with kids still in the home, 
and, um, and, and she had a surgery, and her small group got together. And I know we do this in this church too. Her, her, her small group got together. They gave her two, two, two weeks worth of, of, of dinners and um, coordinated it. Well, it wasn't, but a couple months later, and doggone it, she, she broke her ankle. And, and so the, the, the small group got together, and they got two weeks more of, of meals for this family. And when they were getting to the end of that two weeks, because her ankle was healing, her kids went to her and said, Mom, what are you going to do next so that we can get more meals from the small group because it's really good, you know? And so, um, and, and by the way, that's why it's so important for us to be part of a group because you got to know somebody to be able to love them. And we got we to gotta build trust in those groups so that we can share our burdens. Otherwise, we're, we're kind of like we all got our mask on. Or every, we want everybody to think we got it all together, that everything's good in our world, you know. Oh, yeah, I got it all under control. How are you? I'm fine, man, doing great. But we got to have those people where we get a little more deeper, you know, where we can say, yeah, you know, I got a burden, but we got to, it takes time to build up that kind of trust. And that's why us having our groups are so important. And if you don't have one, let us help you get in one so that you can have that kind of trusting relationship. You know, for anyone, verse three, for anyone who thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And the implication is that if we don't or if we won't bear another's burden, it's because for some reason we think we're too good for it. And he says, man, be careful you don't deceive yourself. None of us are above, you know, putting on the apron and helping serve somebody else. But when we do serve somebody else, that fulfills the law of Christ. So the church of my dreams, when, when we value Christ-like relationships with one another, when we have a heart for spiritual restoration of the wayward, a ministry of burden sharing among the membership, and here's the last one, a mindset of ministry involvement for everyone. Verse 4 and 5, chapter 6. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Let each one test his work. Examine yourself. Are you living this way with Christ-like relationships, with concern for the wayward, with, 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 with helping another bear their burden? Are you living like that? Um, you know, do you have that Christ-likeness living through you? Because the result of the spiritual examination is going to be eventually joy as we walk with the Lord. And if he shows us places where we fall short, we come to him with a repentant heart. He cleanses us and we get freed up to go on and there's joy in that. And as he shows us that, yes, the power of God has been able to, yeah, you know, flow through you as a benefit to somebody else, there's joy in that too. <laughs> But you don't have to rejoice in somebody else and what God's doing in their life. No, you rejoice that God's at work in you, you know? And so we, we examine ourselves. And then, then this last verse, he talks about bearing our own load. Uh, verse 5, for each will have to bear his own load. But wait a minute, verse 2 said we're to carry each other's burdens, and now it says we're to bear our own burden. What's he talking about here? Well, the burden in verse 2 was like a heavy weight. And sometimes we go through times in life when there's just heavy burdens on us. And that's when we need somebody to come and help us. And then, and then other times, we are to all bear our own load. And the word load or burden there, it means like a soldier's backpack. And so like if you got the army, you know, everybody's got their own backpack. But if one guy gets loaded down with a bunch of other supplies, he's trying to carry all the tents or whatever, somebody's got to go help him because he can't bury, he can't, he can't carry all of that himself. And, and he says, but we all have our own backpack, you know. And, and I look at that, that load that we all have to bear is God's call in our own lives, you know. Uh, it, it, it tells us in, in the book of 1 Peter, uh, chapter 4, verse 10, if you could put that one up there, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. But each of us, each of us has received certain gifts to be able to share with others. We all have callings in, in our lives. I wrote down some of my load that I think I need to bear. You know, uh, uh, one, part of my, the load that I need to bear is my own sin and shortcomings. But I can't bear that load. But Jesus already did. And so I can make it in the midst of that load because I have a Savior. You know, part of my load is to provide for my family. I can't delegate that. I'm to manage my finances. I'm to love my wife. I'm, I, I, I am to 
parent my children and, and my grandchildren, and I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church. You know, that's part of my load, part of my calling. I can't just delegate those things. And that's why I need the Lord, you know. Um, and, and, you know, we all have our load. And I believe the secret to carrying the load is leaning on the Lord. You know, we walk by the Spirit. Stay in connection with the Spirit of God. Um, to walk by the Spirit is to depend on the Spirit. If the Spirit of God can create the world and rule history and heal the sick and save us from sin and raise Jesus from the dead, surely the Spirit of God can help hold us up and direct our lives as we go through. You know? Uh, in the days when Gene and I first got married, um, I mean, I hadn't been married long. I mean, I'm talking weeks or months. Um, and uh, I busted up my kneecap. And so I had a chipped kneecap, and I couldn't walk. And I, I think a, uh, you know, one, one, one good uh, illustration of, uh, uh, you know, walking by the Spirit is I had to have crutches to help me get along. Um, and I just remembered one verse that I, I didn't share with you that I really want to. Can you put the one up there about Jesus where he said it? I can't remember. If we go to the next one. Yeah. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, heavy burdened. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus tells us, come beside him. Get connected to him. And as you pull in life with Jesus, his burden on you is going to be light and he's going to He's going to, you know, don't try to pull the wagon all by yourself is what he's saying. And so, so, so if I, I want to go back now, you know, to when I busted up my kneecap, I had these crutches and they helped me. But when I think about walking by the spirit, here's what I used to do. Gene and I lived in an upstairs apartment and the steps were steep and they were pretty treacherous when you're on crutches and you can't put any weight on one of your legs and you're off balance anyway. And so what I used to do is when I'd come home, I'd call for her <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs, say, hey, Gina. And she'd come out of the apartment and walk down those steps and we'd put the crutches on the ground because um, I couldn't maneuver them real well. And I put my arm around her and she'd put her arm around me and she'd bear my weight as I would hop up those steps you know, I just, I think about the Lord. He says, man, connect with me. My, how, how do you put it? My, my burden's light, <laughs> you know? You'll find rest for your souls. If we live by the Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. And as we do, He's gonna begin to produce some fruit in our life, the character of Jesus that's gonna bless the church. Are you living by the Spirit? Have you truly come to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son? Uh, ha have you sensed that call of God in your life to be a, a follower and believer of Jesus, that you would trust Him and Him alone as Savior and Lord? Has that sense inside of you ever been there that I don't understand it all, but I just know that I know I need Jesus in my life, and I call out to him. That's where spiritual life begins. We go from spiritual death to spiritual life through a work of God's spirit that comes in our life as we embrace faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Have you embraced faith in him and begun that? If we live by the spirit, then he says to the rest of us, walk by the spirit, live every day, dependent on the Spirit of God. Live every day seeking out the Spirit of God. Live, live every day, you know, related, connected to Him. And as we connect to the Spirit, who is really the, the, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you know, as we, as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, as we connect to Him, His, His burden's light, and He gives rest to our soul, and He produces that fruit of God and the character of Jesus in our life that we can't do on our own. And so that's my questions to you. Are you living by the Spirit? And are you walking by 
the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Got a lot here, and uh, I thank you that you show us what a church could be right here in these verses. And so our prayer today, God, is, is not that our church would be the church of our dreams. It's not that our church would be the church of our pastor's dreams. But God, we pray that our church would be the church that would meet your vision and that we would be a beautiful bride for our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray, God, that if there's anyone here today that would say, you know, I'm not living by the Spirit. I haven't really come to a living, dynamic relationship with God through embracing faith in Jesus. I pray that today would be a day for a step closer or even a step to go across that line of faith and say, yes, I embrace faith in Jesus. I pray for those of us that need to go back and say, you know, I can, I can read my Bible and do a lot of things, but I may, not, I may not really be walking in the Spirit, and that's what I really need. God, for those of us that need to recommit to you today in some ways, I pray that we could celebrate that as a church and that you would just lead us and free us up for that today. Um, may you be glorified in this place. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you have any commitments today to the Lord, um, uh, we invite you to come that we can celebrate those with you. If you have some burdens and you just want to share some burdens with somebody, uh, we're going to be up here to pray with you. Uh, but this is our, uh, our song of worship that we want to stand for, if you would. Um, and let's, uh, let's just worship God through this song or through our prayers privately or through coming and letting us, uh, let, letting us receive you here at the front. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Shout your praise. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time, all the earth will shout your praise. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will. prayer. Lord, we're so thankful to be gathered here today. Lord, I pray that as we go about this week, that this worship will be lifting us up, that your word will instruct us. Lord, help us to be doers of, of your word. Lord, to show the love that you're teaching us here. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. <laughs>